Okay, so we're going to get started. Hi, my name is Linda. Um, welcome to the NCLA Government Resources Section's Help. I'm an Accidental Government Information Librarian webinar series, or HELP for short, and thank you for coming. So today's webinar um, is called Your City, Your Issues, Civic Engagement Workshops for Staff and Students. And we have with us today one of our, pres our former presenters, she's pre presented with us a couple of times, I think, um, Chris Kay. Chris is the Government Information Librarian for State, Local, and International Documents at Stanford's Green Library. And as of January 2017, she became the head of the library's social sciences resources group. So Chris, I'm gonna hand it over to you. All right, good morning, everybody. Um, thanks for being here on a Monday morning or Monday afternoon. Good morning and, or good afternoon, um, wherever you may be. Um, I'm really pleased to see so many people um, have joined uh, this webinar for this topic. Uh, it's an important topic for me, and it's something that um, over the years as a government information librarian, I felt was um, important to teach, but always found it a little challenging to find um, an avenue um, on my campus or in my community to teach it. Um, so uh, I've actually um, had the opportunity uh, for now the past six, uh, four years um, to work on my campus with teaching civic engagement workshops. Um, so with that, we'll get started. Um, one thing I would ask everyone to do, um, if you could just type into chat the city that you're located in um, and what type of library you work at. I'd be curious to see that. Usually when I do my civic engagement workshops, I have everybody who comes in uh, write their city um, up on a post-it note um, as part of kind of our interactivity. Wow, we got a lot of people. All right, so basically um, for the workshop today, I'm gonna cover kind of the genesis of the workshop. Uh, I'll go over workshopping my workshop. Uh, we'll do a run through the actual slides that I use for the workshop and a quick peek at the activities. Um, I'll go over some considerations and observations um, that I've had over the year or the past couple of years in giving these workshops. Um, and I'll give you um, a peek into what's next. And hopefully I'm planning on leaving about 15 minutes um, for, for QA and discussion, because I would love to hear um, what you all are doing in this area, or if you have ideas based on the information that I've presented to you um, that you would like to share and contribute. Uh, one thing I do wanna say is that um, being part of the librarian and government information librarian community, we all do help each other out um, on all kinds of uh, aspects of our work. Uh, reference questions uh, come to mind immediately, but I feel that we can also help each other build these types of workshops and build a network for this type of work. So if anyone is interested in uh, getting a workshop like this set up uh, for their institution or their library, please uh, do know that um, I am here to work with you and I would uh, also appreciate any feedback um, and input that you have for uh, me um, so I can continue to develop my workshop uh, content. All right, so how did it all start? Um, I've been working with a group um, out at the Stanford Med School. It's an undergraduate class at, under the Community Health Advocacy course. It's a three quarter course and I work with the students um, typically in the spring quarter. Um, I teach a two and a half hour class on state and local legislation. Um, basically, I show the students how a bill becomes a law at the state level and at the local level. And this is tied into their assignment and their work that they're doing. The students are all placed in different community organizations and doing various projects throughout the year for them. And the final quarter is based on, um, is around, is geared to getting them to understand how to be effective advocates for their uh, specific communities. So the intent is to have the students understand the policy landscape and how to um, engage in that policy landscape. The instructors feel, have felt that it's been necessary for the students just to understand the basic legislative process so that way they can effectively advocate for their community. Um, and so when I teach the class, I 
try to get the students to understand that the skill that I'm giving them is, um, is a lifelong learning skill, not just to complete their assignment. That everyone should know how our laws are made from the federal all the way down to the local level. Um, and so that's basically how I've scoped this particular class. Um, we have hands-on activity, um, which is really great. So I get students into our uh, state level uh, uh, legislative um, portal to be able to do bill tracing. Um, the links uh, are live in this presentation. I'm not gonna dip out at the moment, but when you get access to the, the slides, you'll be able to actually see um, my activity worksheets that I've constructed. Okay, so this has just basically been a regular garden variety um, class that I've taught to undergrads over the past several years. Um, and so how did my workshop come about? Um, so one of the instructors uh, had a connection with someone in our Be Well um, <laughs> Uh, community on campus and the Be Well program at Stanford is meant to um, help our faculty and staff um, be healthy and be well basically so there's a, a lot of it's been geared towards kind of um, physical and recreational fitness uh, but in the past couple of years they've rolled out something called um, the commitment to community and the commitment to family um, under a larger umbrella of engagement. This is partially tied into the overall campus planning um, for uh, being having the campus be more um, engaged within the community, both the local community and the broader global community. So our Be Well program um, picked up on that theme in our long range planning and created this uh, engagement component. So the workshop uh, that I have worked on, it falls under this commitment to community. Um, and as you can see here, uh, it's basically um, staff are uh, encouraged to select a community-minded activity, such as volunteering for a nonprofit organization. Um, I won't read the whole <clears throat> paragraph here, but basically this workshop what it was designed to give people kind of an inroads or an entree into um, doing this commitment to community. I basically have adapted my instruction session that I do for undergraduates to a noon workshop that's 60 minutes. Um, it fulfills the commitment to community credit and it's pretty much um, geared towards staff from all over campus, uh, all over campus, although I have noticed that it tends to be a lot from the med school and from the sciences, and my theory on that is it's due to the location where we hold the actual workshop. So it's something to consider where you're holding your workshops in terms of um, people being able to travel easily to get to it, especially if it's a noontime workshop. Um, <clears throat> and I cover basically a Civics 101 for local government, and I keep the hands-on activity as well. Um, and I note here that while it's a 60 minute um, workshop, in actuality it's 50 minutes. What I've observed is because this is sandwiched in between most people's um, workday, they come in anywhere from five to 10 minutes late and need to leave five to 10 minutes early. Um, so I've worked to really scope um, the content to fit into 50 minutes. So keeping that in mind, if you're uh, building out a workshop like this, um, you know, just be mindful of how people are going to be needing to um, move in and out of your workshop um, to accommodate their schedules. So workshopping the workshop, um, I highly recommend doing this. So I have to say, um, moving from a library instruction session for students to giving um, a workshop like this for staff, um, possibly faculty, um, made me very nervous. I wasn't even sure if people would be interested in this. Um, the community uh, engagement um, coordinator um, felt that yes, that the time was perfect. This, and again, I'll, um, this, this all started around 2016 
when I started developing this workshop uh, for staff on campus. So given the political climate, um, she was like, no, I think people are gonna be really interested in this. And we don't have to you know, worry about it being super intense or uh, theoretical or highly academic. Um, I mean, I work at Stanford and <laughs> there are a lot of uh, prominent and preeminent political scientists, political theorists, historians there. So um, I have to say, I, I was a little nervous thinking about what can I, as a GovDocs librarian, um, give these folks that they couldn't get from some of our, our faculty on campus. Um, but I have to say that um, I've changed my thinking on that completely, um, uh, just based on um, giving this workshop and the positive reception that I've gotten from it. Uh, so anyways, getting back to workshopping the workshop, um, as I said, I was a little nervous about doing something like this. Um, would it fall flat on its face? Um, how could I adapt it um, from being just kind of an in-class session to, you know, an engaging workshop? Because my main thing is if you're going to teach a civic engagement workshop, people should be engaged in it and they should be interacting with people. Um, and so, um, I put a call out to my library colleagues um, on campus to see if they would be interested in um, helping me road test basically uh, my, uh, my curriculum. Um, so that turned out quite well. Um, I had 13 people volunteer. My hope was just to have about five to eight people so that way we could, um, you know, not have too large of a group in order to go through questions that I had um, for the participants um, and make sure that I had ample time to have feedback um, on kind of what I was doing and, and the activities and exercises. Um, the Be Well Engagement Coordinator that I had been working with to develop the workshop also attended. This was a huge plus. Um, she was there kind of as just a, a silent observer um, to see how people were interacting with the material um, and we had also gone through the workshop slides and activities before this and had identified areas where I had questions or she had questions about whether or not something would work or the framing of a particular um, topic or idea or concept. Um, so that way she was also um, uh, able to at specific points during this workshop to kind of chime in and ask questions just to, to get people's feedback. Um, so that was really helpful. Um, we did this for about one and a half hours over lunch. Um, and we made sure we had ample time because like I said, I wanted to use this workshop to really kind of think through and, and figure out where some of the, the rough patches were, what needed to be smoothed over, what needed to be clarified, um, that type of thing. So that gave me plenty of time to do that. Um, and I found that the feedback from my colleagues was really great. I got some excellent suggestions. Um, two of the most notable ones is that I changed the order of discussion and, and activities. Um, initially, with the way I had scoped the workshop is we would cover a concept and then do an activity, and then cover another concept and then do another activity. And we had three activities. Um, and we found that people, as soon as I turned them loose with, um, you know, getting to know their city uh, website and their city government structure, it was really hard to get them like all gathered back to continue through the lecture portion of the workshop. So um, uh, several people noted, you know, given the amount of time I had for the, the you know, workshop that I was gonna roll out, I should really think about, um, you know, putting the activities at the end, that way we could just let people go. Um, and, in, and that actually has worked out Quite well um, and so that's been the, the order of the uh, workshop that I've used um, ever since. <clears throat> also we found that having the three sets of activities was a little too much especially for the 50-60 the minute workshop so um, one person suggested you know what give that third um, exercise as homework to continue that engagement and once people leave um, and that's actually worked out quite well as, uh, as well. Um, and then, as I said, this first initial workshopping of the workshop really confirmed that people would be engaged with the material and with the topic. 
Um, I, don't, I always have these like uh, second guesses of this type of um, information and this type of work that I do. You know, are people really gonna care? Is it gonna be really of interest to them? Will they actually take to the material? Is it too basic? Is it too simplistic? Um, and I found that it actually wasn't. So that was um, really um, great for me to, to see. Okay, so what I'm gonna do next um, is basically walk you through my workshop slides and, and the activities, but in an abbreviated way, since um, we don't actually have a full hour to, to kind of you know, give the full workshop. But mainly what I wanna do is show you how I've um, created the workshop, the thinking that went into it, and kind of offer suggestions if you wanna develop something like this. Now I noticed we've got people from all over um, the US and Canada. Um, and so one thing that I like to point out is everyone's um, civic landscape um, is gonna vary from state to state, from locality to locality. So um, if you're gonna work on a, a workshop like this, you know, um, I'm gonna give you kind of some general guidance, but you really will have to dig into your own particular area. Um, and I think that many of us probably, you know, you already do that. You probably already are engaged at a certain, to a certain um, degree with uh, your uh, local uh, governments. And so you just build upon that um, and put in some extra research to pull together all of the materials that'll be appropriate for uh, your municipalities and your counties. Okay. So I thought it might be helpful just to run through kind of what my room setup and supplies are for each of the, the workshops. Um, and um, I find that having a room, and that's actually one of the classrooms that I teach in, it doesn't look too flexible, but it actually um, is. We can move the chairs about. Um, I have a whiteboard and a uh, wall space uh, to be able to do kind of some of the workshopping and, and thinking out loud uh, exercises. Um, I bring my post-its and Sharpies. And as I noted, what I do is I have people write down the cities that they live in. And then we use one of the big um, open spaces on the wall to cluster those um, post-its together. Because what we do for the activities is we get people to group together by their city that they live in. And thankfully we've had enough participants. Usually I get anywhere from 40 to 60 people who show up for these workshops. So we typically get most people have at least two people per city um, to be able to group them together. In some cases we have folks who um, are, you know, from a city that there's only one person. So we'll group those folks together. Um, if there are people who live in unincorporated areas, um, we also will group them uh, as well. Yes, I know, I was, and the attendance level was quite shocking to me. <laughs> um, I don't know why I should be surprised that I, you know, people are showing up for these topics, but I honestly thought that I would get, you know, maybe 15 or 20, you know, people showing up, but um, our Be Well coordinator did a good job of promoting it. And I think part of that was just um, the timing was right. I think people are really interested in engaging at the local level um, and trying to make a difference um, and grasp onto, um, you know, th this, this type of workshop and, and are interested in this type of information. So, yeah. And um, so basically what we do, uh, as I was saying, is we, uh, as we move into the activity portion of the workshop, we would group people according to their cities because one of my um, kind of takeaways for this workshop is to get people um, to talk to other people in their city. That is a form of engagement, especially if they've got um, issues that they might both be interested in you start to build up a network um, uh, of, of like-minded uh, people to, to work on these issues. Um, and so that's actually worked quite well. Um, people get to meet people that they didn't know that they worked with that also live in their same city. Um, a lot of issues that end up coming up um, in the workshop are you know, people's challenges with uh, things like commuting, uh, a development project that people are concerned about, uh, things like that. 
Um, of course, some pens and pencils, copies of the activity worksheet need to be brought. Um, and then laptops, tablets, or mobile devices. This was a little tricky at the beginning. Um, I was schlepping 10 to 15 laptops um, with me over to this room. Um, so the first time we did that, and um, that was just a little too much for me to deal with. So thankfully, um, as we do the, um, the reminder emails to folks for the workshop, uh, we asked them to bring a laptop, a tablet, or a mobile device. Most people, I was impressed, um, they do show up with a, an iPad or a laptop, but we do have a, a few, quite a few people who use their um, mobile device to do the activities. Um, and that's quite impressive because we talk about how um, accessible their city's websites are. Um, and I remind them, you know, you can also talk to your city about the fact that it's hard to find information on their website and that their website isn't very usable um, in these different settings. Um, so we get some uh, usability testing of, of the city websites in when we do this as well. Um, but it is key, you do have to make sure that you have some way to connect into a, a city website and, and have uh, internet connection. I didn't note that you need, you know, Wi-Fi, but that is important because the activities are all about going online and working with the city website. I have them look at the municipal codes um, and have them look up a variety of, of other pieces of information about their city. So um, you do need to make sure that they can connect uh, to the internet in some way. Sorry, my slide. There we go. All right, so workshop goals. Um, I have three main goals um, and it's they're pretty simple, straightforward, um, basically just to gain a better understanding of the local government decision making process. Um, I find that there's a lot of information at the federal level on how a bill becomes a law, um, but I don't know how many of you have run across from your city um, how a kind of bill becomes a law in the local um, arena. Um, I know when I worked in, um, in Los Angeles, I was able to ask the city clerk for such a thing. That was great. They had a really nice uh, graphic that they could share for me. Um, not surprising, it was not readily available on a website. Um, so that was something that I had to kind of dig out. Um, I don't know, I'd be curious if others out there um, have found this for their cities or for their counties. Um, if you have, just kind of drop that in the chat because I'm curious about that. Uh, yes, Jennifer, I found keeping it local is, um, was more, uh, yes, I would keep it local and I'll go into that in, uh, at the end when I go over my considerations and observations. Um, the other uh, goal is to make sure that I explore way or that we explore ways to make your voice heard and connect with your city officials and agencies. Um, in developing out this workshop, the one thing um, that the community engagement uh, coordinator emphasized is she's like, we're going to have people coming from all different backgrounds, from those who have never, you know, they maybe they voted, but they've never had any interactions with their local government, to those who may be on boards or commissions or activists in the community. So we had to make sure that we could offer a wide range of opportunities for people, um, especially you know, given everyone's kind of life circumstances. Not all people are gonna be able to run for office. So we didn't wanna be putting out um, you know, just a very narrow um, set of opportunities with a high level of engagement. We wanted to make sure that people could feel that they could be engaged even if it was just in very kind of um, measured ways like tuning into your city council um, online or submitting comments to an article about an issue that you're concerned about or even just signing up for your city council's agendas and their newsletters and then lastly we talked about some resources for staying on top of the issues in the community. Um, and those are pretty much the basics, you know, how to, to you know, identify your local news sources, um, consideration of using um, Facebook or other social media to follow issues um, that are pertinent to your local government. 
Um, so the workshop outline is basically, um, we have three components. We have a discussion of what is civic engagement. I give a Civics 101, a very brief uh, Civics 101 lesson, and then we break into the activities. So here, <clears throat> um, this is how I open, is what does civic engagement mean to you? Um, I have folks just break into um, small groups where they're sitting, so one or two people. This gives everybody an opportunity to introduce themselves. I ask them to say you know, their name and what department they work on in campus, um, and also say which city they live in. They get another chance to talk about that. And then I ask them to come up with one or two definitions for what civic engagement means to them and what are the opportunities and what are the challenges. Um, and this is a really great, um, again, I usually give about five minutes for this discussion and then we do a share out. Um, depending on the um, size of the audience and kind of the, I don't know, just the kind of overall um, level of engagement that they have, sometimes this is run even longer because people really, you know, dig in and start discussing this topic. I find that a, a lot of people have um, an easier time coming up with challenges to civic engagement than opportunities, which is not surprising to me because um, I know that it can be rather, it can be very challenging to be um, civically engaged, especially if you have, you know, again, I was talking about those life circumstances. You have kids, your caregiver, um, just general work life. Um, there's all kinds of um, things in our lives that can make it difficult to really be engaged um, with your local government. So that's, um, I find that's a good way to kind of set the tone for the overall workshop and also to let people know that yes, it, there are challenges and that's okay. So you have to do, um, you have to be mindful of where you're coming from and do what you can and feel good about that. Um, so typically after we get everybody to share out, I whiteboard all that. As we do the whiteboarding, um, uh, a lot of the responses will resonate with the rest of um, the, the group. And you know, people, we can start checking off things that will um, that you know are common across um, all the different groups that they were talking about their definitions. One thing I wish I would have done um, with that portion of the workshop. So I've taught um, about half a dozen of these. I wish I would have taken pictures of the whiteboard to collect that information because uh, I think it would have been really rich for me to use both for this workshop, but just um, out of general interest and potentially presenting on this topic as well. Um, so that's just something I would say, if you do any type of whiteboarding or you know, breakout, try to find a way to gather that information. I've not been so good with that myself. Um, so hopefully going forward, I'll make sure that I integrate that into um, you know, the workshop that I do. Um, so typically, what I, uh, after we kind of have that discussion, I'll uh, break out and give some definitions of civic engagement, and I like to open up with um, voting. I was actually surprised the first couple of workshops, nobody mentioned voting, um, and, and that was a little, not shocking, but surprising to me, because I always think of voting as kind of the, one of the easiest ways that you can be civically engaged. Um, and so I made sure that I, I spend some time um, on kind of talking about um, how voting is an act of civic engagement. Um, and I actually love this image. It's a friend of mine um, at one of the women's marches. Um, and I was so happy to see that she was photographed for one of our local news um, outlets. Um, and, uh, so it, and this also just resonates with a lot of people and generates um, some fun comments and discussion. Um, I'm also an international government information librarian, and so I was really pleased that I was able to call upon the United Nations Development Program for a really good, solid definition of civic engagement. Um, it's, it's succinct, and I think really kind of covers um, you know, the definition quite well. Um, I also bring in from the Kirwan Institute, this is a really good publication. Um, as well as it offers a really good um, definition for civic engagement. Um, and I'd like to uh, 
use this as a resource for folks who are interested for more um, information about civic engagement. So I've built in both the definition, but also this publication into the workshop uh, content. And then um, I also drew, uh, drew upon the youth.gov um, civic engagement uh, rubric here. Um, one of the things I did to prepare for this workshop is I attended two of the other uh, workshops in this particular community, a uh, commitment to community um, uh, set of, of, of workshops. And so um, they all offered kind of a framework uh, for either community engagement or whatever the other types of engagement that they were talking about. So um, I was a little hard pressed to think of, okay, well, what would be a framework, a framework for civic engagement? And with just a little bit of, of digging, I found this from youth.gov, which I thought really outlined and framed um, civic engagement quite well. So once we go through um, kind of our definitions of civic engagement, um, I launch into what I consider my kind of civics 101. And one of the things that I um, lay out and is basically what are the jurisdictions that we're talking about? And I want to make sure people are mindful that even though we're talking about city or municipal engagement, um, cities don't just exist in isolation. They're part of larger counties. They're part of larger regions. There's special districts that they're part of. So oftentimes decisions and issues that are of concern within your city are also of concern in the larger um, area. So for us in the Bay Area, um, you can see we've got uh, about a nine county reg uh, a region um, and we're very close, geographically speaking. So oftentimes issues dealing with environmental impacts, with development, with transportation, they're going to impact not just your local city, but because people travel um, to work long distances in some cases, um, or, and they live in different counties, a lot of these issues um, span you know, across all these different um, jurisdictions. Um, and so that's just something to kind of help frame and contextualize um, kind of where folks are and um, how some of these issues will be similar across these different either cities or jurisdictions. And the image on the far right on this slide um, is basically San Mateo County. So you can see how close the cities all are together. So, um, you know, in the past couple of years, topics on housing and homelessness have been very important to the region, um, but a lot of the cities have also been working in close collaboration on these topics. So um, that's just something to show that, you know, and also to, to get the point across that if you are dealing with an issue in your city, you can also go to another city that may be dealing with the issue. You can show up to another city's um, uh, city council. You can engage those city council members um, most definitely. That's actually been a question that I've gotten in, in the course of this workshop is, well, if I live in San Francisco, am I able to go and provide public comment at a, um, you know, a, a Palo Alto or a San Carlos um, city council meeting? And the answer is yes. Um, so this is just a, a way to kind of emphasize um, how you can be engaged, not just in your very local community, but in a regional way. Um, and then I, I turned to using the National League of Cities um, to also kind of lay out the kind of formal definition for the various forms of municipal government. Um, if you aren't familiar with the National League of Cities, I highly recommend spending some time on their website. They have a lot of really great and useful um, information on um, just kind of uh, local governance, forms of government, this is not the kind of material that is typically I find in any kind of textbook, um, but they've done a really good job in putting together um, primers and just kind of uh, basic guides on all of this. Um, and then I talk about the two types of form of government um, in California. And I don't know for those of you in other states, 
um, how your um, kind of uh, cities are organized. Um, but in California, we have a charter city and a general law city. Um, and so I'm able to pull from our state constitution in terms of how um, these def what these definitions are um, and uh, give, this is actually one of the activities that I have people do is to figure out, are they a general law city or are they a charter city? And then we talk a little bit about the differences um, in terms of how laws are developed and what laws are used in terms of uh, governing if you're a general law versus a charter city. Um, and an interesting question I've gotten from this particular slide is what happens if a city passes a law, if you're a general law city and you um, pass a law that's in direct conflict with, um, the, with the state statutes? Um, and that was a good question that I didn't have, um, I had an answer for, but it was an off the top of my head answer which I was able to do a little bit of research and get back to the person on. Um, basically, that's when they go to court <laughs> if they need to. Um, and that's where I uh, use the um, kind of assistance of our law librarians to work through that um, particular question. So, um, you know, I would also recommend that when you're preparing for this type of talk, um, you kind of think about all the different kinds of questions that might come up um, in terms of helping people understand these cities and how they uh, work and, and develop their laws. Um, the other thing that I point out to people are the key offices in their cities and that these are offices that they may want to be aware of. One, for um, if they need to engage in any way, if they've got an issue that they want to talk to either city council uh, members, city managers, I point out the role of the city clerk and the city attorney. Also talk about the different boards and commissions, especially those that are um, uh, like the citizen commissions. Many people may not be aware that there's blue ribbon commissions and citizen commissions that they can serve on that they're you know, short term and they're usually around a particular task or issue. Um, and those are often really good opportunities uh, for them to be involved with their city. Yes, Robert, it's dependent on the laws of each state. Yep, so um, again, uh, showing you what I cover for California, you're gonna have to figure out um, what that looks like in uh, your own state and in your own um, counties and cities. Thanks for pointing that out. Um, so then I go into kind of the, how a bill becomes a law um, at the city level um, and Basically, this is how local agencies make things happen. Um, this I got from the Institute for Local Government, which is um, an organization here in California. Um, it was really great. I'm not really thrilled with the slide. It's text heavy. I'd actually like to develop something that's more graphical. Um, I have not had the time or the skill set to do that. So if anyone has those skills and has ideas and suggestions or would like to work on that with me, please get in touch. Um, but this just is basically just walks people through kind of, you know, how um, policies are made um, at the local level. I do point out in California, the Brown Act and open public meetings. I think it's important for two reasons. One, I want people to be aware that um, attendance at open public meetings, as well as the ability to provide public comment is in the statutes and that people are guaranteed that right by law. But also, if they are working on a particular issue and they want to meet with their city council members or their county supervisors, they have to be aware of the, the open um, public meetings law or the Brown Act um, in California, that you can't meet with all of them in one sitting. If you do, that means they have a quorum that's been um, called and that constitutes a meeting that then falls under the Brown Act. So a strategy that they have to be aware of if you're going to be working with your um, local lawmakers is you will be having to meet with them one-on-one -on -one and individually. Um, and also just I remind them that in some cases, depending on the topic or the questions that they bring, they may not actually be able to comment on or respond to some of those questions due to some of um, these particular um, Brown Act uh, laws or Brown Act um, 
some of the stipulations in the Brown Act, excuse me. And then one of the things that I've brought in to kind of illustrate um, the process of um, people being engaged in a particular issue is an example that um, has actually come up several times um, throughout the course of these workshops. Several people have been involved with this issue in one of our cities um, where there was a gun store um, that was opening um, and the city, a, a group of people in the city kind of uh, rose up um, to block it. Um, and I show this for a, as a demonstration uh, of a couple of different issues. One is the amount of time it takes. Um, as you can see here, this issue first cropped up in 2017. And as of January, March of 2019, um, they were working, the city was working on adopting um, the firearm regulations. So it took a couple of years. Um, and then I also, you know, point this out to show um, how local coverage of these issues is made um, and then how they can use these type of um, articles to, you know, figure out who they might want to talk to. Um, are there other groups that they might want to align with if they're interested in this particular issue? Um, and then we move into kind of, remember I said that kind of spectrum of engagement. So from kind of very um, easy, what I would consider easy, um, you know, low barrier of entry engagement opportunities up to very high level of engagement. Um, and so this is just kind of a checklist um, that people can run through. Um, I should point out that the organizations linked in the, the bullet, the last bullet here goes to the League of uh, Women Voters. Um, who do some really good policy um, briefs uh, for the local community on particular issues. So I would also recommend that um, for those of you, if you're looking for other uh, groups to tie into this, look for your League of Women Voters, um, especially if they have local chapters, but the state level chapters can also be really great as well. Um, and then we move on into um, a, you know, more opportunities. Um, and getting involved. Um, and lastly, I do put the, the kind of, I try to plant the seed of running for office. I have to say, I've heard of one person who has run for their local school board um, after um, coming to one of these. So that was, I thought that was really cool. Um, I don't know that this, that the workshop was necessarily the impetus to do it, but I like to think that at least it, if they were thinking about doing it, this maybe helped to, to kind of push them over the edge and really, you know, take that leap into um, uh, community service in that way. Um, and then for the local area, I just point out um, some of the different opportunities for training. Uh, San Mateo County does a really good job of teaching a Civics 101 for the county level. Um, I've taken that um, and found it one to be very useful for developing this workshop. But it's also, um, they teach it every, um, I think it's every other year. So I've encouraged people to take that as well. Um, and then reminding people about getting out to vote. And um, this, you know, past uh, year, we've got Census 2020 efforts. So encouraging people to get involved with um, Census 2020 um, complete count committees um, and working with their local um, organizations uh, to do that as well. Um, and then just a long laundry list of uh, resources for folks. And then we dip into um, getting to know your city. Um, and so there are two activities that we cover in class is the city structure um, and getting to know the issues before um, you um, in your city. And I'm gonna hope that this screen share will work. Yes, it did. I hope everyone can see that. So this is basically um, the worksheet that I give them. Uh, I worried it was too much and the amount of time that we had to work on it, but actually um, through the workshopping exercise and then just teaching this uh, workshop, um, I found that people got through it. People were doing the bonus questions that I gave them. Um, many people had never really kind of had a chance to kind of dive into their city council website and look at what they had there to look for the agendas. Um, sometimes this was the, the first time people have ever looked at the municipal codes um, for their cities. So that uh, is you know, something that people find really interesting. And it's 
really cool to see how once people get in there and look up, you know, I had them looking at marijuana laws or um, smoking regulations, that they started thinking about what was important to them. And they're like, well, what is in this, the municipal code on this particular issue that I'm concerned about? Okay. Um, and then I have some additional and forthcoming content. So this isn't really prepped and ready for prime time but it'll give you an idea of what I'm thinking about adding. And it's based on questions that I've received um, throughout the course of these different workshops. Um, so kind of giving people a, a better idea of how cities, counties, special districts um, kind of all work together. Um, and this was something that I um, found through the Civics 101 class that I took with the San Mateo County, <coughs> excuse me, through San Mateo County. So just kind of giving people more um, overview of, of counties and county governments, a discussion of unincorporated areas, because we do have um, people at least one to two at each of the workshops who are living in unincorporated areas. Um, so they're interested to find out how does that, um, work, how does all this work for them? Uh, going over regional governments or councils of governments, special districts, um, and then just other types of boards and commissions. So in conclusion, um, I have some considerations and observations. Um, so Jennifer, this gets to your point of, um, yes, you can do this at any jurisdiction. Um, and the federal is what I've always seen it covered. I've uh, taught that um, I don't work on federal government uh, documents in my current position, but in previous positions I did. Um, but I found that the focus on uh, local is, is just, it's timely right now. People are interested in it. And it's also, I think, easier for people to be engaged at the local level. Um, you know, when you're working up at the national levels, there's a lot of other different challenges um, uh, that can be presented that people may not have the time to travel um, and such. Uh, I found that resources for local level aren't as ample as at the federal um, level, and I would say also for state level. So, you know, you've got everything, you know, ProQuest has, you know, tons of things that they can kind of hand you to, to do this type of work. At the local level, I found I had to really scramble to do it. Um, make sure you're weaving in your professional or your personal civic engagement experiences into the workshop. Um, I do that. Um, I, I talk about a group that I worked with um, that was trying to save an ice rink um, from being closed down. And so I'm able to kind of weave that in. I've all, I also weave in some of the other work that I did down in Los Angeles. Um, it helps to personalize it and also show that, you know, how you're um, involved in your local community. Um, as I mentioned before, cultivate good working relationships with your campus or county law librarians. They're great to talk to about some of these issues because uh, a lot of this is dealing with actual laws and regulations. Um, so I've relied um, on my uh, law librarians to ask them questions to help me find specific um, uh, case law or find things in our state statutes or in the municipal codes. Definitely do not skip out on activities and getting people working together in this in this type of workshop. Um, and I know this is going to be a challenge going forth in the Zoom environment, so that's something I will have to work on. Um, and as I noted, this may be the first time that some of your participants will actually look at their city's website. And I find that just really thrilling when people do that and they're like, wow, and then you just kind of see this light bulb turn on and they are really interested and they like, I didn't know this, I didn't know that, I didn't know, you know, that this, that my, you know, uh, city council was structured this way. I vote for these people, but I never really think about who they are and what they do. Um, and I would also make sure that you use and incorporate participants' experiences with local government. You'll find that you'll have people who have been on boards and commissions or are community activists that show up and really incorporate their work and their insight. Um, I also try to make sure that I temper the discussion um, with, uh, with uh, temper this discussion to let people know that, you know, 
not everything works out as you hope. A lot of times if you've got an issue that you're trying to um, you know, get before counsel or that you're advocating for, sometimes you, you don't come out on the winning side. And working with governments can be very challenging. It's not easy. So when you have people who have actually done the work in your workshop, it's great to be able to incorporate and give them some time to talk about what they did and what they found challenging and what they found rewarding. Um, and lastly, um, this is just something I have to remind myself that as librarians, we are very well equipped to do this. Um, we know how to find the information, we know how to convey it, and I think we know how to work with um, community members, with staff, with students in a way that maybe faculty or kind of experts in the field um, don't. The one piece of feedback that I've gotten consistently from my uh, in-class workshop, so working with the community health advocacy group, as well as this workshop, was the just actually getting people in to the databases or to the portals to look up a piece of legislation or to look at a city council agenda and read the minutes or to actually just figure out, oh, this is where the city code is and then this is how I search it and this is how I actually find something in it. And then what's next? I have an upcoming um, workshop that will be on Zoom. It's going to be 90 minutes. This was actually developed before um, our shelter in place orders came out. So it was actually supposed to be in person. Um, so this will be interesting. I see somebody's asked about how um, I'm gonna convert this for online. I, that is what I am working on this week. <laughs> so stay tuned. I can um, let you know how that works, but I'm looking at doing um, kind of breakout rooms, figuring out ways to get people to be able to share out. So possibly using whiteboards, it will be a true experiment. And I've not done something like that before. I'm hopefully going to do a run through um, at the end of this week, just to kind of road test out some of these, um, these options. Um, and the other big thing is I wanna make sure that I take into consideration the impact of, of COVID-19 and, and what's going on right now and being mindful of that. Um, so I think that's it. I know I went a little over time. I went way over time. Um, I wanted to give uh, about 10 or 15 minutes at the end for questions and comments. Um, we've got probably about five minutes, so I apologize for that. Um, but let me see what we've got in chat, if I missed anything. Jennifer had a, a question about assessment tools um, that you've used. Yeah, okay, so for the, the staff um, workshop, um, yes, there is the, actually the Be Well um, group, they send out an assessment. It's very lightweight, um, so just basically, you know, did, you know, kind of the, the common questions, was the speaker knowledgeable, um, did it meet your expectations, that type of thing. And so those have all been really positive, um, and the comments have all been very positive. So, um, but I haven't done anything myself, I probably should do that, um, and that would be something I'd be good to work on. <clears throat> Like I said, I have some anecdotal, um, you know, information about how effective this was, but that is going forward something I would like to do. I should note that currently um, the Be Well uh, classes like this are on hold um, given the current situation. So we'll see when I get this back up and running for that that particular community. Let's see. Great, thank you. And there was a question, um, content of the civic engagement in a pandemic link? Not sure. Yes, there is. Okay. Um, that's basically, if you, <laughs> that is a very quick Google search, but there's some really great articles on there. There's one from politicalscience.com that I would recommend. Um, NPR actually has um, done a story on this. And then not surprisingly, World Health Organization, UNICEF, have some resources for this. There, um, our Stanford Innovation Lab has an article about it as well. So 
clearly people are thinking about this and there um, there's a lot of uh, resources that are starting to come out so that's what I'm trying to make my way through at the moment to kind of um, read through all of it and then compile kind of the things I think that will work best for the this upcoming wor uh, workshop great thank you very much I think are there any last questions that we missed in the chat we had a lot of good questions today um, um, so I have carved out um, for the activities 30 minutes. So um, basically I do about 25 minutes of kind of talking on the Civics 101. Um, and that also includes about five to seven minutes with um, kind of a discussion on what civic engagement is. And then, like I said, because of the way the staff workshop has been run, um, see here sorry my cat is on my keyboard um, <laughs> um, <laughs> okay um, with the way the staff workshop has been run you know people will leave early because they've got to get to you know their next meeting um, or they have to get back to work so sometimes you know they can only spend 15 or 20 minutes working on that um, but it really just depends on you know how much time you've got for your um, session. If you've got a 90 minute session, you can give a little bit longer uh, time. Frankly, I feel it's better to give more time to the activities. Um, I also walk around during that time and answer questions and see what people are coming up with. So that's a chance for me just to kind of um, mix and mingle with the groups. Uh, so, uh, Jennifer was asking, has your attendance increased or decreased? Is this now part of a bigger event on campus? Um, no, actually the participation has been pretty stable. Um, I would say, you know, the first time I did it, I think we had 40 people and then we moved to a bigger room um, because she, the, they had to cap it at 40 people. So when we moved to a bigger room that could accommodate 60, um, it inched up a little bit more. So like I said, I think the maximum I had at one point was at one of them was 60 but typically it's about 45 to 50 people. Just wanna say thank you again, Chris, for, for doing this. This is a great topic and a lot of really good off information. Uh, Jennifer is asking, how often do you offer the workshops? Yeah, so um, <laughs> Jaina, who's the person who's, who runs the, this component of the Be Well um, uh, engagement uh, series, she would like for me to teach it quarterly, a couple times a quarter. I just can't do that um, given my schedule. So typically um, I teach in our like winter or spring um, quarters and I do one or two workshops per quarter. So right now, not that many. Um, and you know, I would I would love to have more time and bandwidth to, to do this more frequently, but I don't. Yeah, thank you so much for sharing. Thank you, everybody, for coming. And uh, I think that 